Thank you all for joining. Today's webinar from the Earthquake Country Alliance is the San Simeon Earthquake 20th Anniversary. And this is from the Earthquake Country Alliance. If you aren't familiar with us, we are a statewide private partner grant, uh, grassroots uh, coalition of leaders with experts who work together to develop a lot of the resources that we provide and organize activities like ShakeOut and also uh, promote Tsunami Preparedness Week coming up at the end of March get support from the California Office of Emergency Services through FEMA support for these activities. And we're headquartered at the, actually now the statewide California Earthquake Center at USC. And you can join us at earthquakecountry.org slash join. Our chairs for ECA Central Coast, which is the region that includes the area impacted by the San Simeon earthquake are Anthony Rodriguez from the Food Bank of Santa Barbara County, and Stacy Silver from Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management. Anthony, you're with us today. If you could please uh, 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 introduce yourself and welcome us. Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Rodriguez with the Food Bank of Santa Barbara County, also co-chair of the ECA Central Coast. Thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. And today I have the great pleasure to introduce Scotty Jalbert. He is Emergency Manager for San Luis Obispo County. Um, he will give a brief welcome as well. Scotty? Great, thank you, Anthony. Um, on behalf of the county, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, the San Simeon earthquake had a significant impact to all of our communities and it was one of the largest disasters in our county's history and one of the largest disasters in recent history in the state of California. Uh, this earthquake caused over $239 million in damages, destroyed 25 homes, uh, 55 other homes uh, received major damage. Uh, there are 47 injuries and unfortunately two fatalities. So this uh, earthquake was very impactful and um, I hope this afternoon that all of you get some good takeaways uh, from the presentation and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Scotty. I really appreciate that. So now we're going to go over uh, today's agenda. We're going to start with an overview or the geological setting of the earthquake. Then we're going to hear about the fire and rescue response. Next, we'll learn about the damage that happened and how it was repaired. And finally, how the California Earthquake Authority responded and helped the homeowners recover. See you guys in a few minutes. To begin, we have uh, Russell Gramer with the U.S. Geological Survey to talk about the geologic setting of the San Simeon earthquake. Okay, good afternoon. Um, since this is a talk to a non-technical audience, I thought I would start with just a little bit of uh, geologic background about the uh, California earthquakes and the forces that caused them. What we're looking at here is a map of major faults in California with the San Andreas fault system shown in black lines. And most of the major earthquakes shown as the red, you'll note that most of the major earthquakes with a few exceptions off to the east fall on the San Andreas system. But the 2003 San Simeon earthquake uh, indicated by the arrow there was not on one of the major faults of the San Andreas system. Uh, next, please. Uh, the faults in California, uh, I'm sorry, the earthquakes in California are, are caused by release of stress accumulated on the boundary between the Pacific and North American plates. Uh, motion of the Pacific plate relative to the North American plate is shown by the arrows, bends and compresses the crust until it breaks and releases the stress. Faults are zones of weakness along which many cycles of bend break have led to measurable offset on the rocks on either side. Major faults have seen many miles off offset over many, many repeated earthquakes. Next slide, please. Uh, not all faults are created equal. Uh, as the plates move, sometimes they move towards another, one another and cause compression. With compression, rocks break in reverse or thrust faults. 
Uh, with extension, when plates are moving away from each other, rocks break in normal faults. And with lateral shear, where the plates are moving alongside one another, the rocks break in strike slip faults. Strike slip faults are the most common faults in the San Andreas system. But again, the San Simeon earthquake was not a common earthquake. Next slide, please. Compression and extension can also happen where strike slip faults like the San Andreas, like those in the San Andreas system, uh, bend or step. The orientation of the fault uh, deviating from the overall direction of the shear causes compression or extension. In this simple, simple illustration, you can see uh, that in a left step of a right uh, of a right lateral system, uh, compression. Uh, occurs. Next slide, please. Here's a sandbox model of a compressional or restraining step. Uh, you can see that the sand in the middle, this is a real sand, uh, the sand in the middle uh, is being pushed up uh, by the compression in the step of the, uh, of the strike slip fault. Uh, we can see it a little bit better in the next slide. Next, where uh, we have the map view on the right and cross sections or vertical slices through the sand on the left. You can see that uh, the <laughs> things are moving. Uh, you can see that uh, the layers in the middle have been pushed up and over one another on, uh, on thrust and reverse faults because of the compressional step over in the strike slip fault. Now, moving to reality. Uh, this is the geologic map of the uh, Cambria quadrangle. And this is why they invited me. This is my map. Uh, you can see the epicenter of the San Simeon earthquake is the big red star. Uh, you can uh, see that the map has lots of colors. The colors represent different kinds of rocks. One of the ways that we map where faults are as we, is that we look for the boundaries between disparate kinds of rock. Uh, next slide will zoom us in. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, this zooms us in on that same map. Now I've labeled some of the faults. Uh, the San Simeon fault is a strike slip fault, part of the San Andreas system, one of the, our major faults. Uh, the Oceanic fault is a thrust reverse fault. The Nascimento fault is a major fault, but we think that that one isn't active anymore. And the Rinconada fault is another strike slip fault off to the Northeast also a part of the main, uh, main fault in the San Andreas system. You can see, didn't mean to advance quite yet, you can see that the uh, epicenter of the uh, San Simeon earthquake isn't on any of these uh, faults that we're looking for in map view, but if you recall from the earlier slide, not every fault is vertical, so uh, and since earthquakes occur deep in the earth, you might not expect the uh, epicenter to be right on a fault if it wasn't vertical. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. In addition to observing the rock relations at the surface, we can also use small differences in the earth's magnetic and gravity fields that are caused by different kinds of rocks in the crust to illuminate the rock bodies where we can't see them at the surface, for example, under the water, as well as estimating their shape and how they project into the subsurface. This image shows a map of small changes in the magnetic field in that Cambria quadrangle. The coastline is shown by the blue line, and again, the epicenter of the San Simeon earthquake is that bright red star. You can see that uh, some of these magnetic bodies, as shown by the hot colors, are truncated by the, the faults that we've talked about. 
for example, on the left, that uh, northwest trending uh, bit of yellow and green is clearly chopped off by the SSF, the San Simeon Fault. Uh, in the middle, uh, near the epicenter, you can see that the uh, that the long band of hot color is truncated by the oceanic fault. Next slide, please. Faults are also uh, marked by their effect on the landscape. This figure, which is a bit dark on my screen, hopefully better on your screen, uh, shows is a shaded relief image of the landforms in the in the Cambria quadrangle. Uh, you will note, I hope, that in the area of the bright red star that is that is our epicenter, uh, there's a, there are mountains, and that uh, I that uh, those mountains uh, diminish to the southwest. Uh, my 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 copy of this figure has the the faults uh bright red but uh so i apologize for that but uh, uh we lost that somewhere along the way uh you'll i think at this point have to take my word for it that it's the oceanic fault and the san simeon fault that, that formed the boundary between the mountains to the northeast and the much more low-lying ground to the southwest Anybody who has ever driven along Highway 1 in Big Sur uh, to the south down to Cambria knows the place where these faults go out to sea because that's the southern end of the dramatic Big Sur coast. And as you drive south of that, you're on flat lying ground and you speed up to 55 miles an hour. Next slide, please. So this image shows a map of what we call focal mechanisms or beach balls. Uh, a little diagram on the left shows how beach balls work. Uh, basically, they show that the direction they show the direction that the fault moves in an earthquake. Uh, a beach ball that or a focal mechanism that uh, is like the one on the top in the diagram. Uh, indicates strike slip or lateral movement, horizontal movement, whereas beach balls that are showing the stripes like the ones in the middle show vertical movement. The point here is to look at the San Simeon earthquake, which is the big beach ball in the middle. There it is. Uh, and you'll note that that is a reverse or thrust earthquake not a strike slip earthquake like the one uh, that we see over at uh, Parkfield on the San Andreas Fault in the Northeast. There you go. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is a map, a color coded map of the earthquake uh, the and the, all the tiny aftershocks that occurred after the uh, San Simeon earthquake. If you were out there, some of them might have not have felt so tiny, but they're all much smaller than the main shock. You can see uh, with the green color being the deepest and the red color being the shallowest uh, near the main shock, which is on the left. Uh, the main shock was very deep and many of the uh, aftershocks became shallower, shallower going off towards the oceanic fault on the bottom of the map as well as going off uh, away from the oceanic fault uh, towards the top of the map or the north. Next slide, please. If we again look in cross section, these are vertical slices through that same map. And now you can see instead of color coding for depth, we just can see the depth. You can see that the main shock uh, is down around uh, almost 10 kilometers, depending on how you interpret it. There's two, uh, two ways of deriving exactly where the earthquake, it, uh, where the earthquakes are shown here. But clearly illustrated by all of the aftershocks are uh, 
two faults, not just one. The one on the left going up towards the oceanic fault, and then another fault going up to the right, uh, an unnamed fault, not connecting to any named mapped fault at the surface. These uh, smaller faults that ride on top of main faults in a thrust system are called back thrusts or back faults. Next slide, please. This map shows the, uh, the INSAR, which is a very careful uh, measurement of changes in the elevation of the ground surface in the days after the earthquake. Unfortunately, we didn't have an image before the earthquake to calculate change, but this is what happened in the days following the earthquake. The patch of red and yellow and bright colors uh, shows the area that was uplifted. And if you look at the graphs on the right, those are sections through the lines labeled 3, 4.4, and 7. And they show that there was quite a bit of sudden or abrupt uplift near the oceanic fault in the days after the earthquake. Uh, but you'll notice that that uplift extended beyond the surface trace of the oceanic fault itself. This suggests that maybe the oceanic fault is forming a new strand to the southwest uh, that just hasn't had enough repetitions of earthquake to form a recognizable fault. Remember that faults take many, many earthquakes to generate the kind of offset that, that we can see. The very big jump in the top graph on the right that you see there that looks so spectacular, that is a jump of 50 millimeters or, you know, about, a, about the size of a finger. Next slide, please. So here's how I interpret the, uh, the faults that moved during and after the uh, San Simeon earthquake. You can see the beach ball. Now it looks like a it looks like a strike slip, but don't be fooled because we're looking at it from the side. It is still a thrust beach ball. The main shock strand is the, uh, the low fault on the left. Uh, that fault must connect up to the oceanic fault, but as we just discussed. Perhaps there's a new strand of the oceanic fault that is, rupt is beginning to rupture to a new surface trace. One of the things that's a little bit confounding about the San Simeon earthquake is that even though it was quite a large earthquake, it did not cause any recognizable surface break. There was no place you could go on the Earth's surface and say, here's where the fault, here's where the earthquake broke a fault on the ground. And you can also see the, the somewhat complex back fault going up to the right that was triggered and moved in the hours and days after the big San Simeon earthquake. Next slide, please. So how, what is driving this thrust fault in the middle of a system of strike slip faults, the San Andreas system? Well, here is a sketch map or a simple map of the faults in the San Andreas system. And you can see that the San Simeon earthquake here has occurred, as we said, on the oceanic fault, a thrust fault uh, that is occupying a restraining bend or step in the strike slip system. There's also compression due to a small variation uh, between the plate motion and the orientation of the San Andreas system. Those two factors together combine to produce 
the thrust fault earthquake uh, that happened on the oceanic fault uh, and the compression that is driving the uplift of what is labeled the Santa Lucia range as opposed to the much more uh, low-lying uh, area labeled the Los Osos domain. These restraining bends and these restraining bends and steps uh, accommodate uh, the strike slip offset that has occurred and is occurring along the San Gregorio, San Simeon, Hosgrey fault. Uh, that slip does not pass, does not pass the transverse ranges, does not pass down by Santa Barbara, but instead is being deflected to the east uh, to rejoin uh, or get back to the San Andreas Fault proper uh, in the LA Basin. Okay, next slide. So here's a quick summary. Uh, the San Simeon earthquake was a thrust fault uh, earthquake on the Oceanic Fault. Uh, the Oceanic Fault is marked by uplift and high topography on the northeast. It's not a single crack. It's a zone of cracks with perhaps more forming. Uh, the San Simeon earthquake triggered slip on a complex suite of faults, including back faults. Compression on the Oceanic Fault results from the restraining geometry of the fault system, as well as regional compression. Significant earthquakes are not limited to the major strike slip faults and significant earthquakes are not all strike slip earthquakes, but include thrust reverse earthquakes. The type of earthquake effect can affect the shaking. So it is necessary to understand the complete picture of the faults in the San Andreas fault system to understand the earthquake hazard. And my last slide is a 3D picture of the faults in the San Andreas fault system. You can see the little red star there is the San Simeon earthquake. And hopefully this conveys a uh, sense of just how complex the fault system really is. Thank you very much, Russell. And Anthony, could you go ahead and introduce our next presenter as we get the slides going? Yes, absolutely. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dan Turner, fire chief, retired fire chief for Cal Fire San Luis Obispo. Um, chief Turner retired from Cal Fire after a 37 year career. He has extensive experience in managing major emergencies, including 12 federally declared disasters that include Loma Prieta earthquake, Northridge earthquake, Oakland Hills tunnel fire, Santa Valley floods, Santa Cruz can County floods, and numerous major fires. Dan was chief of Cal Fire San Luis Obispo, the county fire department, and the county fire rescue mutual aid coordinator at the time of the San Simeon earthquake. Thank you so much for being here, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. My, uh, my, my pleasure to be here to give you a little bit of background on the uh, fire rescue emergency response component of this earthquake. Next slide, please. So, as you might imagine, there were some immediate steps uh, right after the shaking. Um, what the fire uh, system is accustomed to here with these types of, of uh, earthquakes is to go to a, a default organization. So it's a countywide incident command system organization where the, the incident command post is the department's operations center. And then each battalion becomes a branch and each station becomes a division within the ICS to parse out and manage a incident that's this widespread. Uh, so their purpose is to respond to immediate emergencies, collapses, fires, rescues. Um, it, and one of the interesting things is trying to uh, triage or assess people that are say they're trapped when actually they're just isolated. They're not in an emergency situation. They're just inconvenienced. But trying to sort through and triage those those issues is an important part. And then uh, you know do a quick countywide assessment, situation report. What's the capacity status? of the response organizations. Uh, next slide. As you might imagine, uh, there were a few things going on. Uh, this is a large county, 3,200 square miles. And um, there were structural collapses, there were structure fires, 
uh, some actually near the epicenter at Oak Shores. Uh, multiple buildings damaged, resources were immediately overwhelmed as well as the neighboring resources. And it was interesting, uh, as, this, as the slide says, names matter. So it quickly came out, this was the San Simeon earthquake, which caused a lot of focus on San Simeon. Hearst Castle is in San Simeon. There are hundreds of visitors at Hearst Castle uh, in a concrete structure. So part of our concern was what kind of rescue operations do we need to do it at Hearst Castle. Next slide, please. Next slide. Obviously, we knew there was an uh, impact in downtown Paso Robles had significant business district uh, structural collapses. We knew there were fatalities. Uh, there were other multiple buildings that were damaged that required searches. So again, all the local resources were immediately overwhelmed as well as all the neighbor agencies. So our purpose was to try to coordinate operations countywide to parse out and triage where we're going to send uh, limited resources to be most effective. Next slide. So one of the other concerns that we have is uh, some of you may know Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant is in San Luis Obispo County, sits on the coast um, in the midst of this. So that was a, a major concern was what was the status of the nuclear power plant? Did we have to deal with a, uh, a radiological emergency as well as uh, the, the earthquake emergency? Next slide. So our next steps, which uh, getting over that initial step was to you know, make sure we deploy staff to the County Emergency Operations Center, Pass Robles Emergency Operations Center, Pismo Beach Emergency Operations Center, and then coordinate with all the other EOCs in the county. That's the role of the Fire Rescue uh, Mutual Aid Coordinator. Uh, and then to make situational reports to uh, our regional offices, both OES and CAL FIRE in this case. And then we, uh, very shortly after the earthquake struck, we put in a order, a order for resources from out of the area through the OAS system and CAL FIRE system. Uh, one of our primary concerns was major incident management team. We knew we were going to have long-term incident support requirements. Uh, we ordered engine fire engine strike teams for search and rescue operations, hand crew strike teams for uh, debris removal and, and um, things of that nature heavy rescue resources and helicopters. And uh, part of that was to start to prepare operational support plans for multi-day operations. And we established a major, major incident base to support those operations. Next slide. So one of the things that, that we learned from the Loma Prieta earthquake was the need for a primary and secondary searches in the rural areas. Um, in the rural areas, um, when the earthquake hits, there's no phones, there's no power. And there's no one to hear if they scream. So there's nobody around. So uh, getting out resources out there to make that primary search is really important. Uh, it takes a lot of resources and time to do that. But one of the, the benefits we found was that um, the responders, when they showed up at these residences, reduced the stress on the locals because they found out the world didn't end. There was somebody out there to help. Um, you can't do this by helicopter. If you flew over the building in this image here, it would look fine. Doesn't look fine from the ground. So a lot of that just has to be a ground-based search. It takes a lot of resources to do that. Uh, next slide. So that major incident management team's mission, uh, because it's going to be long-term support, uh, they do operational support. You've got field teams working 24-7. Uh, you got planning support, trying to do where, what, when, who. Uh, logistical support, feeding, sleeping, supplies for all of these folks that are coming from out of the area. Remember, this is an earthquake. So you have a lot of displaced local residents that are taking up any uh, you know, readily available hotel, motel spaces. Uh, and then public information, which is a huge component of this. Uh, media, you know, official reports, and the public information. So that initial mission of that incident management team was to support the first responders the hand crews, the fire rescue teams, other responders, and take the load off the local responders because they're victims too. You know, their homes may have been damaged, uh, you know, loved ones, et cetera, injured or, or have challenges. So that's another functional role of, the, of those teams and the out of, out of area resources. Uh, next slide, please. So long-term support, uh, once that initial search and rescue operations uh, were concluded, the team switched to a secondary mission, which was support 
for all the out-of-area building inspectors, specialists, investigatory teams, OES and FEMA that are in now looking at, at buildings, trying to determine their structural viability, their salvageability, et cetera. So uh, that's uh, part of what their secondary mission was. Next slide. And as they say, and then they arrive. Um, so elected officials arrive. They always have an important role in, in these types of disasters. They, the public wants to see them. They do create an impact, however. So part of that major incident management team's job is to coordinate and manage this, this um, operation. Uh, you know, the elected officials want to talk to, they want to talk to local elected officials. They want to talk to responders. They want to talk to public and victims. They want to do site visits and they want obviously media opportunities. So preparing and being ready for that type of operation uh, is an important function because it does shut things down. Uh, operationally, uh, in this case, it was uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, but I've been on earthquakes where the president shows up and it definitely causes a, a, a hitch in the operational get along. So be prepared for that. It, you, uh, it, it's going to be an issue, but it'll pay off in the long run. So next slide. And that's quick, but uh, emergency uh, fire emergency response is really about trying to reduce damages, save people, uh, reduce further injuries, get a countywide assessment, make sure we can respond to the other emergencies that continue to happen besides the earthquake, and then try to take that load off of the locals um, so they can do what they need to do. And in this case of earthquakes, uh, you know, heal their own problems. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Chief Turner, thank you very much for joining us today and for those comments. And um, Gabby, are we seeing any questions in the chat? No, I don't see any questions. But if you do have questions, uh, please do put them in the chat and we can um, respond to them or perhaps Chief, you can uh, type a response as well. We'll go ahead and move on to our next presenter who is, uh, I'm just gonna bring you on, Alan. Uh, Alan Hansen, who is uh, uh, retired from Simpson Strong Tie, one of the companies that uh, manufactures a lot of the, the braces that go into buildings to make them strong, either at new construction or in retrofitting, um, is also one of the chairs of the ECA SoCal region. Uh, and Alan, I, you're going to talk about your experience back 20 years ago. And uh, I know you were there and took a lot of these photos that you're about to share with us. Uh, yes, so this was, um, uh, as I said, 20 years ago, I was with Simpson Strong Tie for 24 years, and I handled the Central Coast during the earthquake. So I used to call on architects, engineers, contractors, building officials. So that was my background there. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Mark. So this is a um, photo outside the clock tower building. Um, that was the uh, main building that collapsed. Um, go ahead to the next one. So Acorn building or clock tower, uh, two women died in this building. They ran out the side door and um, the second floor collapsed on top of them. Had they practiced drop cover and hold on, they might be alive today, but unfortunately they didn't. So go to the next slide, please. So here's some information here. Uh, probably the noteworthy thing about this was they were, uh, the uh, family of these women sued the owners of the building and they were awarded 2.4 million. So uh, no, retrofit, no retrofitted buildings collapsed, but uh, this was the first time I know of that they successfully sued the owner of the building. Go ahead. And uh, after that, California enacted AB 2533, go ahead again, which called for this warning sign to be placed in unreinforced masonry buildings. And you saw these go up like crazy afterwards. Um, next slide. Other damage, complete building collapse. So this was another one uh, down the street from the Acorn building. Next slide. Buildings had to be braced. So this was common, the bracing on the building. Um, in fact, probably the um, most uh, misunderstood about these types of events, the big 
contractor that's in demand are house movers, house, house bracers and that kind of thing. So that's where they come in handy. Next slide. Next slide, please. So unbraced parapets were also a common problem. So there was a mandate to brace the parapets and uh, retrofit the buildings. And uh, some of them were done, some of them weren't. But, uh, go ahead, next slide, please. You can see here, this had not been retrofitted. Luckily, it didn't collapse, but it certainly could have. Next slide. Another parapet wall failure. So this one did collapse. And this was interesting because they were they put it in rebar and they were going to use gunite to um, retrofit the structure. So actually spray it like you're spraying the inside of a swimming pool. Next slide. Close up of that. Next slide, please. So this one was reinforced before the earthquake. Didn't suffer any damage, luckily. Next slide. You can see here the uh, braces were put in. I'll show you in a second what they did on the inside. Next slide, please. Next slide. This was a more recent retrofit. So this was probably done after the earthquake. And you can see how the uh, plate washers go down at an angle. That's the roof sl sloping down there to uh, shed water. Next slide, please. Next slide. Post earthquake products. So this was, uh, someone's having trouble seeing the screen. Is that everybody or not sure? Um, in any event, this was after the earthquake. Next slide, please. Parapet failed in the earthquake. Next slide. And you can see where that. Uh, fell off there where it collapsed. It either went back on the roof or it went out in the street. I'm not sure which, but they had rebuilt it by the time I got there. Next slide. So this was how it was reinforced inside. So the hold downs, the uh, devices you're seeing screwed into the uh, trusses, uh, they would tie the roof rafters or the floor joists to the walls. So you can see the bolt going through on the other side. It would come out with a plate washer and... Uh, um and nut on the opposite side so that's how they tied the roof system together next slide that's a close-up next slide please so uh even adobe buildings were not immune to this quake so this is the mission in san miguel uh, next slide please walls braced common theme throughout these uh, earthquakes next slide so um, they used our uh, column caps to support the roof. There was about $2 million in damage, and it was um, reopened in 2009. Next slide, please. City downtown, slow. So this was in response to the earthquake in Paso Robles. They uh, jump-started their retrofit program and really got going on it. Next slide. So this one, another building has been retrofitted. Again, you can see the plate washers on the back side, tying the roof rafters or parapet braces to the um, structure. Next slide. And you can't spot a URM building by looking at it and seeing um, that uh, it's brick. A lot of them have been stuccoed or that kind of thing. So this one was a URM building, but uh, in effect, it doesn't look like it. Next slide. Uh, San Luis Obispo retrofit underway. Next slide, please. So these are actually floor joist straps that typically tie a floor joist to the um, stem wall. In this case, they used it as a wall tie, but interesting how some of the engineers came up with these uh, novel ways to retrofit. Next slide. Uh, going the opposite way, they use blocking and straps. So that's how they... Um, do the tie the opposite direction and that's where the four by four or four by tens come in and the uh, joist hangers and straps next slide single family homes so this is in templeton a little bit west of the 101 next slide please and typically this is where they get damaged the slide before that the gentleman from the fire department showed so the uh, garage that had collapsed next slide uh, patio pulled away, dropped about four inches. Next slide, please. Uh, piano bounced up and uh, hit the wall four or five inches above. Next slide. 
So this one is really interesting. This was an outbuilding that uh, slid off of its foundation, or I'm sorry, the, the entire garage slid. Next slide, please. So uh, moved about eight inches. Next slide. But the interesting thing on the next slide yet, yeah, keep going, the new elbows connected the uh, hose bin. So the entire slide and uh, entire structure was um, um, slid on the foundation, didn't crack any of the windows, the garage doors operated. All they did was reinstall the water, even though um, it was, um, it had moved about uh, eight inches. Everything was fine inside the structure. Next slide, please. House was retrofitted and the garage was undamaged and left in its new location. Next slide, please. Uh, this house separated from the rest of the structure, the right hand side did. Next slide. And uh, as I say, holes and shear walls are a bad idea. So next slide. The cripple wall racked. Uh, this is a raised foundation house and uh, it moved around a lot underneath. Uh, next slide. The rim joist buckled, which is not uncommon in this type of construction. Next slide, please. That one was demolished. Uh, next slide, please. Shadow Canyon. This was also um, west of the 101. Um, this, um, this one also uh, slid off the foundation. Next slide. So this one slid off in such a way that the anchor bolts broke out of the CMU block. And um, go to the next slide, please. So you can see how the uh, sill plate tore off of the foundation. Um, again, how the anchor bolts pulled out, the entire house slid on the top of the foundation. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see bent anchor bolt. So this one is kind of, uh, you can see how far it slid off, um, but the anchor bolt didn't break out of the uh, cell that time, the rebar held it in place. So next slide, please. So this was also interesting. Uh, I mentioned house movers were the big trade that was in demand after an earthquake. Uh, it was that way in Northridge and Whittier Narrows. This one is no exception. They pulled the house back on the foundation with these cables and uh, next slide. They're pulling it back here. Next slide. And they even have hydraulic jacks to lift it up to get it in position to slide back on the uh, foundation. Next slide, please. Again, they raised it up with hydraulic jacks and uh, got it back uh, on top of the wall. Next slide. Uh, they bolted a new ledger in, as you can see there. Next slide, please. And again, much like the um, uh, URM buildings, they used the PhD hold downs to tie the floor joist to the wall. Next slide, please. Uh, Mike Sherbert, this was a co-worker of mine, um, gives advice to John Cudla. He was a structural engineer out of Paso Robles that did the retrofitting on a lot of these projects. So they were uh, looking at the um, method they'd have to use to uh, put in new anchors. Um, next slide, please. They used UFP retrofit plates on the sill plate. Next slide. And this shows how they tied it together with the anchors going into the concrete uh, CMU units and the uh, screws going into the mud sole. Next. And this goes over what we've already talked about. I'm sorry, I went through that pretty quickly, but we were a little bit behind. So, um, you know, there you go. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I think there were a couple here, but... Uh, uh, let's see. 
There's just one that um Alan that says the city allowed the building owners to retrofit a parapet wall. They're guessing uh, they're wondering if it was uh required to be secured. Yeah, and that's typical on those uh, unreinforced masonry buildings. Uh, they're going to have a parapet of some kind. So um, they were braced back to the roof. They'd have angle iron that would go back in and would tie it uh, back to the roof. So that's definitely one of the uh, requirements of the uh, retrofitting. Thank you. And there's a second one asking if earthquake insurance was effective for people. Uh, that would be a question for Janil. Yeah, coming up. <laughs> um, okay, so it says not retrofit, rebuild. Well, that's a good question. I mean, um, that one um, parapet wall you saw, that was completely gone. So they did rebuild it, and um, they would have braced it back onto the roof. But um, the other one with the gun, I, that one was completely redone. So... You know, I guess that would be a rebuild there. Okay. Anything else? Alan, thank you very much for that really fast, but very good overview of all that, uh, the damage that happened and, and really uh, great pictures of the retrofitting or rebuilding. Uh, as you said, we will go on to our uh, next and final speaker, uh, who is... Uh, Janine Maffei, the Chief Mitigation Officer for the California Earthquake Authority. So uh, we'll get her set up here. And um, there you are, Janine. Thank, Thank you for being with us today. And go ahead. Thank you, Mark. And I'm uh, assuming you can hear me? Yes. Great. So I am a structural engineer and I'm the chief mitigation officer at the California Earthquake Authority. I wasn't with the organization uh, at the time of this earthquake and joined in 2011. Next slide, please. <clears throat> tell you a little bit about the California Earthquake Authority. We're not a state agency, but rather an instrumentality of the state created after the Northridge earthquake. Uh, like today, insurance crisis, insurance companies leaving the state because of the losses of the Northridge earthquake, the CEA was created by the state to kind of back up um, participating insurers and keep insurance companies in the state. Uh, our mission is to educate, mitigate, and insure, insurance being the, the core business, mitigation being an important part of our business, um, the mitigation program as that I manage, I'll tell you about at the end. And then finally, if you do hear, we are involved in the California Wildfire Fund. That is coverage for wildfires caused by investor-owned utilities. So that money would not go to individual house, house uh, owners, but rather to uh, utilities. So that mother is, money is intended to keep them from bankruptcy. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the Northridge earthquake was the, uh, the, the reason for creating the California Earthquake Authority. So all of the earthquakes down below that 1994 earthquake on this, this table um, were before earthquakes. We didn't have modeling at the time, really didn't understand the expected damage. And along comes the Northridge earthquake, $40 billion in losses, somewhere around 40% of houses insured, half of those Half of that 40 billion was uh, residential damage and half of that was insured. And that's why those companies were losing their shirt and leaving. You compare that to the San Simeon earthquake, uh, $250 million in losses and um, only about $3 million in losses to the CEA because prices went up precipitously <laughs> after the Northridge earthquake and there weren't that many people insured. So. Uh, insurance was definitely effective for those for those who had it around the San Simeon area, but unfortunately, um, it, financial um, pressures have made it so that um, not as many people have the insurance. Um, so important to note the difference between these two earthquakes: the the, the size, number of da buildings damaged, fourteen thousand versus four hundred and eighty. Next slide, please. And if we look at the shake maps, um, pretty close in terms of kind of. Geographic area, you know, Northridge earthquake hit a larger geographic area. If you look at the warm colors, they're going to be the areas of stronger shaking. That's what this map indicates. Bright red, um, much, much stronger shaking. Um, but the, the most important difference between these two is that the Northridge was a direct hit on a, a, a very densely urban environment. 
And so there's there's the huge difference between the two. You put that San Simeon earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area in the East Bay, or uh, down in a, a densely populated part of South, um, Southern California, and obviously we'll have different results. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, wanted to just mention a couple things about earthquake insurance and the observations. So these observations come from not only San Simeon, but really from all the earthquakes of the um, that happened um, throughout the 1970s and 1980s is a realization that there had been an architectural change in the 1970s. And that's what this house represents. This house is, is a little bigger than you'd see in the 1950s or 40s or 50s house. A uh, much bigger open plan on the inside of the house, removing walls, that kind of open space between kitchen and family room, maybe even living room. Um, and then the introduction of uh, T111, the plywood on the side of this house, it really is only three eighths inches where, where the nails are going into the, the studs and not effective. Um, so lots of, there was actually a tick up, a significant tick up in damage um, you, would, you would expect that houses get better as the building codes get better, but we actually saw damage get worse in the 70s because of these architectural changes, as well as um, there were a lot of changes in building departments running out of funding and not doing um, nail inspections, for example. Heard this from a, a couple of earthquakes. Next slide, please. And you can see this, this typical, there's another T111 house, that plywood. Um, in many cases, it doesn't even look like it had any nails going um, all the way around the plywood. So poor construction practices, poor um, observation by perhaps um, the building department, and then just a general architectural changes that created more damage to buildings. So um, uh, Alan showed you quite a few older structures that were definitely damaged. They tend to be more vulnerable, but I just wanted to point out this anomaly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So I wanted to tell you about a program, although that the CEA has, I mentioned mitigation is one of our charges. Uh, Earthquake, Brace and Bolt has now retrofitted with grants up to just over 23,000 houses. The house must be in an EBB zip code. We're certainly in the central part of California now. Successful applicants receive up to $3,000 in a grant. Supplementary grants are available for income qualifying households. You can find us at earthquakebracebolt.com. And the next slide is uh, great news. Um, this is the retrofit. This is the Napa earthquake. On the left, a house that was not retrofitted. On the right, a virtually identical house that was retrofitted. House on the left, not yet reoccupied, two and one half years after the event. House on the right had damage. You know, it sure quite crazy, but was not off of its foundation and was habitable after the event. Next slide. So here's where we are throughout California, the, the kind of blue overlay along that San Andreas fault zone that stretches down the coast of California. Registration opens January 10th and it's gonna be open through February 21st. Check us out. So this is for a pre-1980 house that has a raised foundation with a crawl space and needs that retrofit uh, underneath the house like uh, Alan was showing you with those foundation plates. Take a look and if you don't have a house like this, you may know someone who does, point them in our direction. We're in 814 zip codes now and we'd be delighted to help you or um, one of your family members or friends become more resilient in an earthquake. And with my last slide, I believe we'll make sure there are no further questions for anyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janiel. And there were two comments even before your talk that we can kind of uh, address to you now. One is uh, from Tracy Olson in the Q&A. Uh, basic statement and question, are earthquake insurance effective for folks? How might you right. ask for that? So I, I think that um, it's important. Everybody looks at the deductible and goes, wow, that's really, really huge. And for a moderate side earthquake, yeah, you may not um, go too much over your, your deductible. Um, really when that deductible, uh, I mean, pardon me, when that earthquake insurance is gonna be most useful is in a very large earthquake. Uh, or if you're in, an, in in a damaging earthquake and you are in those areas of warm colors, like if you were in you know, certain areas um, of the San Simeon earthquake, you could have had enough shaking to really have significant damage, particularly if you have that older home, absolutely would be effective. Um, once again, if you're, it's a smaller earthquake or you're a little bit further removed from the earthquake, you know, you're gonna do one of these and say, okay, I, you know, it missed me. Um, we do have um, more than just the 15% deductible. There are other deductibles that are available. They cost more. Uh, I will tell you that uh, insurance and natural disasters are really in some ways not a good match in that um, 
it's extremely expensive. And so um, I think we're, we're gonna have to start looking at how we, we build to make it more resilient. Uh, we're putting these very rigid structures. Even our new construction is, is somewhat of a disconnect between how buildings move and natural disasters are affected. Um, so to, to, to be the best protected, you wanna make sure if you have an older house that you've looked into retrofitting and um, check out earthquake insurance, see if it is in fact the right solution for you. Get an actual quote from someone, look at the CEA's premium calculator, shop, don't just look at ours, shop around and um, see if that is the right financial decision for you and your family. Thank you. There's just a couple more questions. Uh, one is if there is a require an income requirement for the earthquake brace and bolt program. No. So for the the three thousand dollar grant, you just need to have a qualifying house, be owner occupied, uh, and be in one of our zip codes. So um, and then you do the retrofit with a permit in accordance with our rules, up to three thousand dollars. You have to have a particular household income. It's somewhere in around the eighty thousand. Uh, or less is the household qualifying for the supplementary grant. And that total grant goes up to $10,000. So in many, most cases, it's gonna be paying for the entire retrofit. Thank you. Another one is, can it be done um, to houses that are on a slope? No, this is not for houses on a slope. Hillside houses are a very different animal. This is for houses that have a maximum of seven foot cripple wall at the tallest uh -huh. end. A house that's on a, on a slope is going to have a tendency to that, that bottom really tall wall is really going to want to move. And that anchorage to the top is extremely important. The only deaths in single family houses in the uh, Northridge earthquake happened in these pole supported houses that just had this tremendous amount of movement on those, those downhill walls. Um, so this is not for hillside houses. Okay, maybe the last comment um, here is please comment on the garage retrofit with an overlying second story. Right, we have another program called Earthquake Soft Story for soft story single family dwellings. So it's a similar condition to the soft story rent ordinances that are being adopted throughout the state for multifamily, but this is for single. And essentially you've got all that mass. You, you saw that house that had moved with the garage with just one story. Now put a second floor on that. That would have come down all the way. Um, the idea here is those two spindly walls, either side of the garage door, just don't have the stiffness or strength to hold that second floor up. And so there is a retrofit. Um, you'll find information on earthquakesoftstory.com um, on our, our website. We don't have registration open for that program right now, but if you have that condition, it would give you an idea of the kind of retrofit that you should be looking at. You can always get a contractor to come out and give you a bid so that you're prepared. You have an idea of what that vulnerability might cost you. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. We are just over time. Just want to mention there is a survey link, surveymonkey.com slash R. You can see it on the screen. We're going to put it into the chat uh, slash R slash SXDWJV5. And uh, just a, uh, there's a question. If you register for Brace and Bold, is there a time frame when the work has to get done, Janelle? Yeah, absolutely. With a grant program, we have to have deadlines. We don't want anyone to get to the end of their retrofit and there's no money left, um, but we give you a lot of time. The most important thing, we give you time to get a contractor, get the permit, then we look at all that stuff. If we give you the go ahead, we give you six months. If there's a problem, we absolutely um, allow for extensions. We want people to be retrofitted. So, um, you know, once you're in our, you know, once you're in our little family, um, we want to get you through the program. Uh, all right. And then uh, one last last, last question. Uh, would you be able to speak anything about parametric insurance, Janelle? Yes. Yeah, so parametric insurance is an interesting, the idea is a flat amount. Um, you know, there's one prominent parametric, it's about $20,000 and you pay a certain amount every month. And what happens after an earthquake is there's some trigger and it's either, um, you know, sometimes it's MMI, which is, you know, the colors I showed you on that map. It might be um, some trigger of, um, uh, you know, kind of a scientific coming from seismographs. But anyway, that says that your area, in fact, saw some pretty significant shaking. And they'll define to you before you start paying for it what that trigger is. If you, your house is, is close enough in an earthquake that it was within that triggered area, you would get that 20,000. No claim adjustment has to happen. You could have, frankly, very little damage. 
Most important though, you could have more damage than 20,000. So the important thing that I point to people is, I, we have nothing against this product, but make sure that you're not thinking that 20,000 is gonna make you whole, particularly if you have the older home. Thank you, Janiel. Uh, do look in the chat for the link to our survey, which we really hope that you will uh, complete uh, so we can get your feedback for today's webinar. Uh, you can follow up with us, of course, on our website at earthquakecountry.org and in Spanish at terremotos.org. Follow us on social media. And if you have any further questions, if you have any questions for our presenters, we'd be happy to pass them along to them. Just email info at earthquakecountry.org. Again, we will be putting the recording of the uh, presentations today and the PDF of all the slides on the website at uh, earthquakecountry.org slash San Simeon 20. It's the same place that you went to register uh, today. So thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your day.